All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Danae Aber. I'm the executive director of the Louisiana Rural Health Association. Thank you so much for joining us for this Rural Infection Prevention and Control Training Program webinar. LRHA is happy to present this program and the webinar series with sponsorship by Well Ahead Louisiana and in partnership with Southern Evals. Today's session is part two of the hospital basics of infection prevention and control. If you missed part one of the webinar, which was held on June 15th, please visit our website. You can watch the recording there. You can download the slides. This webinar is also being recorded and will be available on the same web, uh, web page along with a copy of the slides. Um, I will drop the direct link to that page in the chat here in just a second. Your line should have automatically been muted when you join the session, so please remain on mute until you are either asked to speak or we reach the Q&A session um, to prevent background noise. After the webinar, we will send you a link to a, a brief survey um, to complete. It'll be in the chat box and I'll also send it via email. We do ask that you please complete that survey. It's part of uh, the requirement for our grant evaluation and it also helps to make sure that we continue to improve all of our future events and give you the content that's useful to you. And with that, I would like to welcome Taylor Catano, the founder and CEO of Southern Evals. Taylor is a board certified infection preventionist and has previous experience as a frontline nurse specializing in critical care in the medical and surgical intensive care setting. So thank you so much, Taylor, and I'm gonna hand it off to you. Absolutely, thank you so much, Danae, and welcome everybody to part two uh, of our webinar series uh, for the RIPCT program. Uh, look, we've already covered a whole bunch of stuff today. Really, we're gonna be talking about um, exactly on a day-to-day -day basis, what it looks like for an infection preventionist and what items that we're going to look at to track, to trend, and to make sure that we're correcting whenever we find those. So we will get into it. All right. So again, uh, some shout outs. Um, you know, really, uh, each time we like to say where everybody's from or how long you've been in in the role and have you signed up yet but really what I'd like to hear is um, if you were part of the last webinar was there something that you took and uh, and put into place in your facility and we will start with let's see we'll start with Miss Dana Haynes I will ask you to unmute you should be getting something Hey, actually, the last one I watched was the rural health, and um, it has really given me a lot of information. I've been in this role for about a year and a half now, and I still feel very new to it. So I love every oper learning opportunity I can get. So they've been very beneficial for me. Oh, very good. Very good. Good to hear. You know, that was the main thing we wanted to do is make sure you could take some of these things and turn them into actionable items and, and put into practice. So, no, great to hear. Great to hear. All right. Let's see, let's go with Miss Holly Calhoun. Miss Holly, did you learn anything from last time or were you a part of the other webinars? Let's see, I will click to ask to unmute. Give it a few minutes. All right, we will go on to uh, Richard Hinton. Let's try that one. Were you part of the last webinars and did you learn anything that you could take to move forward? Hey, Taylor. Yes, I actually went to the uh, clinic webinar after I did our first infection control webinar. Sure. And uh, I, somewhere in the process there, I've actually started putting together a binder like you guys had pushed in both of the webinars I had watched. I have a lot of stuff that was online on computer and files, but I didn't have an actual physical binder thing. So I'm in the process of building that now. Thanks to you guys. No, absolutely. You know, it's it's just something I know we're moving towards technology, but that I see Bible or even having those resources available to when those regulators show up that we can just hand them something that's organized. A lot of the time it takes the guests work out of it and we can just talk about what we've been doing good in the facility. So no, great to hear. Great to hear. So all right, well, let's get into it. Um, we are, so again, Southern Evals, we are a regulatory compliance healthcare consulting company. I'm a board certified preventionist, and that's what I help our clients do on a day-to-day -day basis is make sure that they succeed with their compliance, whether it be state or accrediting body, and my specialty, uh, the infection control side, which I know a lot of, we've seen it a lot lately, COVID's kind of ramping back up. 
Uh, so again, the focus has been put on prevention of infection. So uh, that's what we've been doing. Okay, so when we talk about our hospital basics, um, the first time we were talking about all of those things we need to put in place, all those documents, all those items that CMS looks for, that a crediting body looks for, today what we want to do is review the day-to-day -day practice of an infection preventionist. And, you know, mainly a lot of times what we get is we get a preventionist in and then we're like, look, I just got into this, I got an office, or maybe I'm sharing an office, and now I know some of the things I need to do, but what what is exactly do I need to do? Where is there a checklist? Is there certain things? And that's what we're going to talk about today, what, we all, what we've been recommending for our clients to do and what we've had great success with. All right, the three Ps. So paperwork, we talked about the paperwork elements you needed and you just heard, putting that binder together, getting those elements organized. Uh, policy and procedure, those items that you need to have resources, not only for yourself to know what you would do in those situations, but also for your staff to know what to do in those situations. And today is practice. That's what we're going to talk through today. So remember, we can make a difference. As an infection preventionist, we are a huge part of the hospital, of the clinic, of the community. And a lot of times when folks don't have that knowledge base and they have questions or they're confused, they come to you. And they're going to ask you those questions, so specific things. So know that you make a difference and that you're making an impact. So practice, the day-to-day -day practice of a hospital infection preventionist. So when we talk about that, that's exactly what we try to do is we recommend having a checklist. Um, you know, all regulatory agencies, they have that one thing in common. They come and they look for specific things. And throughout our years of practice, we found that if those are organized, you have those base elements, that you have a much smoother uh, journey with your surveyors or a much smoother survey than it would be if you're pulling things from all over the places. So, um, you know, the checklist we put together, it covers all those bases. So as you can see, um, we call it, we've got the eyes in the sky, but all of these things um, from what you need to do on an annual basis, what you need to do on a quarterly basis, a monthly basis, and a daily basis. It's great to line those things out because as you've seen in, the, in your role, a lot of things can come up. A lot of new items may, may happen. You may have construction going on, uh, COVID happens, and it all adjusts. But these base elements, if you make sure that these things are covered, um, then you will have regulatory success and you will have a program that actually gets some action items that you can, that you can uh, put into place. Okay, so for the monthly duties, which we're going to talk about on a monthly basis, because that's the easiest way to say, okay, let me make sure I have these things that I'm looking at, uh, at least on that time period. But what we say, or what we see a ton of times is in the infection preventionist role is, look, I've heard it a million times, I feel like, you've got a ton of data, but what are you doing with it? Uh, you know, survey after survey, they ask that question, and, and if they're handed a pile of data and we don't talk about the good success that we've been having or how we're tracking things or what the, the state of affairs looks like for infection control in our facility and we can't properly identify that or display that, there's where the confusion lies. So what we recommend and we're going to talk through today uh, are the monthly duties. Um, and it starts with your ICQAPI program, your quality information. You know, what are we doing to make sure that we're protecting employees uh, and our patients? And also, how are we getting better on the places where we are struggling, whether it be with the process, whether it be with organization? Um, how are we tracking that? And a lot of the quality program falls into one of these things underneath this list. Um, we're going to talk about environmental rounds, how you go around your facility to make sure things are, are neat and orderly. Um, hand hygiene and mask observations. You know, there's been a lot of technological advances where we can do some digital observations, but what do we need when it comes to that? Um, infection line listing and reporting. You know, uh, how are we keeping track of what's going on in our facility and how do we identify trends when that happens? And then who do we report those to as a preventionist? Um, we're going to talk through that. Employee health. Um, you know, a lot of times in our infection prevention role, sometimes that's tacked on top of what we do. Now we got to worry about flu vaccines, Hep B, vaccination proof or series, TB tests, flu. I mean, it's a whole lot of stuff, um, but we're going to talk about what's required and what you need to look for on that front. Uh, and then I see committee minutes. How do we wrap everything up? And then we share that with administration. We share that with med exec. And who needs to be a part of that team to make sure that we're making the impact? And the last thing and the most important thing that I will say uh, when it comes to getting better in your facility or when it comes to evidencing the, the stuff or the, the things that you're doing in your facility is corrective action. 
how, what corrective actions are we taking and how are we evidencing those? So uh, I see in the facility quality program for so CMS, um, they say the infection control officer needs to provide evidence that problems identified in the infection control program are addressed in the hospital quality program. Um, Joint Commission says, does the hospital implement its infection prevention and control activities, including surveillance, to minimize, reduce, and eliminate the risk of infections? Um, but what is the problem here that we see most times? Most time in the facility, when it comes to infection control and it comes to the quality data we report, it's inconsistent. Um, a lot of times it doesn't make sense, or usually it's just unorganized to where they can't understand uh, what's going on in your facility. Uh, you may have some data over here, you may have some charts over here, but if it doesn't paint a clear picture, it's very confusing for the surveyor, and it's very hard for us to evidence to our staff that we're making progress. Um, so those, those are the biggest things. You know, it's really expected that your IC indicators are not only tracked, you know, we're looking at those things like hand hygiene and we're tracking those on a monthly basis, but also it's expected to be trended. Looking at those things from a month to month basis to say, hey, are we getting better? Are we staying the same? And do we need to take action with that? So the data points we're gonna talk about in the quality program. So if you think of quality, your IC quality as your macro, these are your micros. You've got your environmental rounds, which would be touring through your facility, all areas of your facility, looking for deficient practices or different uh, items that are out of compliance. Number two is observation and abstraction. What we can see, what we can get secret shoppers to see, or what we can record, and then also how we abstract some of that data to see what's going on in the facility. And then the last thing is corrective action. When we find those items and we find what we want to start working on, how do we correct those and how do we evidence and check back in to make sure that those things are corrected moving forward. So, what we say is you always want to be tracking and trending with work towards getting better. So you're going to track and trend it, but you got to be working towards getting better. Quality is a system. It's always something that we can work on to get better. And it's the same thing with infection control programs. Okay, so the first one we're going to talk about is environmental rounds, uh, identifying the deficient IC practices in your facility and ensuring your staff are knowledgeable. So Danae, if we could put up that poll um, what we want to just get an idea of is in your facility currently, how often are you doing environmental rounds where you're looking at all areas of your facility? And we'll give it a few seconds um, to give people some time to vote. So what does that look like? Are you going around daily and walking through the whole facility? Are you going through weekly? Uh, checking in on certain things? Are you doing it monthly? Or is this something that, look, I'm so busy, I'll get to it maybe quarterly or or, uh, you know, we do one big sweep annually, uh, or is this something that you're just absolutely not even doing? I'm not looking in these areas. I don't think it's important for infection control. Um, you know, what does that look like? And the second thing is, do you have a process for correcting the items that are deficient? So whenever we have that report or we have that item that we find that is deficient, um, are we taking the steps to document and evidence, hey, this is what we're going to do to fix that, and this is how we've corrected it? Um, do you have a process or do you not have a process? All right, so we got a few votes back. That looks good. Okay. Yeah, so we got some weekly, some monthly, and it does look like folks are correcting those. So that that is excellent to hear. And uh, look, there's no right or wrong answer for this. You know, uh, environmental rounds are important no matter when you do them, as long as whatever you're identifying, uh, you're working on correcting. All right, so in environmental rounds, um, let's see. So this is looking anywhere and everywhere for items out of compliance. So what are the goals of your environmental rounds? So the goal is to identify your areas of non-compliance that exist and making sure that you cover every area in your facility. You know, as the infection preventionist, you've got to think that, uh, you know, what we do ranges throughout any service line, whether it be dietary, whether it be on the, pay on the floor, whether it be in storage closets where housekeeping is, whether it be in radiology. I mean, anywhere where we have healthcare going on, there are some items that we need to put our eyes on to make sure that we're in compliance and that it's not a risk for someone to spread infection or for a possible risk of infection to be in that area. Um, who can do them? Environmental rounds. We've seen everything, but these can either be done individually if you want to take the responsibility to do that, or it can be done with a team of people. You know, we've worked with larger hospitals, smaller hospitals, and even clinics 
Um, and uh, some of the, the best rounds that we've seen have been individuals, but also we've seen different perspectives like your plan ops director or your department leaders or your, you know, your, um, your central supply uh, director, like they have a different perspective of things they're looking for outside of what you're looking for. And a fresh set of eyes is always great. Uh, and then how often? You know, our recommendation has always been uh, to perform environmental rounds, thorough environmental rounds on a monthly basis. And the reason for that is uh, in terms of frequency, monthly, we can go back. If we've identified op items that are out of compliance, we can tell those or give these reports uh, to the folks who can, who can work on those, whether it be department leaders or whether it be um, different managers, and we can make sure that they work towards fixing those and we can follow up on a monthly basis to make sure we're making progress or if we need to adjust what we're doing to get those corrected. So uh, employee knowledge, whenever we're talking about environmental rounds, I, I want to talk through a couple of the things that we recommend you look for, you know, whenever you've got the opportunity and as a preventionist, you know, we preach, you don't need to be held up in an office just working on paperwork all the time. Um, the, the best preventionists that we've seen are those that are trusted by the facility, that all the employees know who they are, they know they can go to them with questions, and they know that they are working constantly to increase education and to make sure it's a safe place. So with that being said, especially when you're doing environmental rounds, this is a great opportunity for you to test employee knowledge. Um, especially with COVID-19, one of the biggest things we saw was understanding the process, understanding where PPE was located, and those are items that you can, you can uh, understand where the knowledge base lies as you go around and do your rounds. So as you see in here, you can see uh, when do you use PPE, uh, when do you wash your hands, you can go down, what cleaning solution do you use for cleaning surfaces, how long is the kill dwell time with your cleaning solution. So these are items that you can quickly off bat from a friendly perspective. We're not the regulator, we're not the bad guy, but we're gonna judge the knowledge of that staff. Um, if there, if there's a, you know, folks that aren't familiar with different things that you're asking, that you can take that time to do that education. And if you notice that it's across the board, you know that you need to do further education for the entire uh, facility. So, like I said, you know, one of the things we do is we walk around when we're asking about cleaning. Again, we talked about this in the last webinar. You got to have an understanding of low level disinfection and how you clean. Well, you know, bring a bottle of wipes around. And, and like we do, we circle the contact bottle. So we say, yeah, you, you clean with these, right? Oh, yeah. Well, then how long is the dwell time on that? How long do you have to leave that on a surface to be clean? And um, even some of the most compliant facilities, this, this, these kind of things fall through the crack when it comes to education. Um, and this is just your opportunity to make sure you can do that quick education or identify if that's a problem that you need to dig further into. Okay, patient care areas. So we're talking about the floor, anywhere patient care can be provided. Um, you know, number one, you're, you're looking at overall cleanliness. You're looking from the ceiling to the floor. Um, are there, are there stains on the ceiling tiles? Is the floor dirty? Are there items that are stored on the floor? You know, even to equipment, we're looking at equipment. You know, if you've got ice machines in your patient care area, how often are those getting cleaned? Uh, who's responsible for that? If you've got different, uh, juice machines or, or coffee urns or water pitchers or anything like that, how often are those being cleaned and those being labeled? Um, and then, you know, like I said, you're looking high and low, vents, walls, ceiling tiles, all of those things. And as you also have different areas in that patient care area, make sure you check in on housekeeping as well. You're looking to see if the restroom is cleaned, if it's stocked, it has those things that, uh, that either visitors or patients need to wash their hands properly. Um, or the vents clean is even, even from a housekeeper's perspective, are, are carts stored in the hallway? Or are they brought into the room? Uh, and are they locked? Are they uh, are the chemicals that we're using secured? Um, all items for either safety or prevention of infection that we can be looking for. And what I did is I put a few examples over. So on the far left, you can see you've got a dusty vent. Uh, you can see that you have stains in your light. You can also see the floors dirty. And also you can see that in the patient care area, you've got linens that are uncovered. So all of these things, your regulators are going to be looking at, and you can quickly notice those and identify. You know, we always talk about the three survey findings. The three types of survey findings are, number one, you've got where the surveyor found it, and uh, you had no idea about it. 
um that's that's your mid ground right there that's where they totally surprised you you didn't know about it and now you 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 understand you're going to do something about it the worst survey finding is if they find it and we already knew about it but we're not doing anything about it that's the one that they don't like so with these reports this is allowing us to find those deficient areas and just start work on those and that's the best type of survey finding you can have is if they find something but we already have a proactive plan as to how we're fixing that so i did want to mention that um, still in that patient care area, we're looking at FF and E, furniture, fixtures, and equipment. Do you have uh, chipped uh, desks? Are there missing uh, coverings on those? You know, if you've got exposed wood, you can't necessarily clean that properly. Um, when you comes to patient care equipment, kind of like a wheelchair or a vitals machine, uh, how do we understand that those have been cleaned and where are those supposed to be stored? You know, those are the questions that you want to ask and have a process for. And if that process is not consistent, you want to work on. Um, other things are paper signs, you know, just like that exposed wood, you can't properly clean a paper sign. Um, if you notice those, that may be some education you want to do for your staff on how to cover those or get those signs laminated. Um, when we go into patient rooms, you know, we're looking at things like uh, cracked beds or cracked furniture or even, even uh, folks stuffing different trash in the cracks of the furniture. Um, you know, it poses a risk for infection to harbor or it can't properly be cleaned. So are you looking at your mattresses? Are you, are you picking those mattresses up to make sure that they're cleaning underneath those mattresses? Uh, those are items that you want to pay attention to. Um, for your supplies, are your supplies stored properly? Or are they just out in the open um, to where, you know, they can be tampered with by your visitors or your patients? Or are they stored properly? Uh, that's also, you know, something to make sure that security is in place as well. Um, and then, again, these are things we find all the time, but remote controls or different items that have been taped, you know, taped to fix that. You know, tape is one of those things that um, we use in healthcare, but it is not, <laughs> it is not able to be cleaned. You know, if we've got tape on mattresses, if we've got tape on chairs, if we've got tape holding our remote together, uh, we need to make sure that those are repaired or replaced. Okay, when it comes to the nurses station, I know this is a hot topic um, and it's something that, you know, when we're working with facilities, we have a, a clear understanding of what the expectation is. And then we also understand the day to day of hospital and when we get a break and when we can't. But these are the items that you want to look at to see if it does become a problem that you need to address. Um, or is the furniture or the chairs that are in the nurses station, are they in good condition or are they torn up? Um, desk nursing station, is it cluttered? cluttered? Is there food and drink? Is it dirty? Is there all kind of different uh, items on that desk and it's not organized? Uh, that's a problem. You know, is PPE available for those nurses? Do they have access to PPE and do they know where it is? Um, so all of these things are items that can be looked at. Um, what we see usually in nurses stations, again, we see uh, torn furniture. We see clutter, as you see in that nurses station right there, where we've got a mixture of food and paper paper. Um, also, folks that don't have a lot of room, we see a lot of items being stored underneath the nurse's station. Um, remember, those items need to be stored properly and you can't properly clean under there if you got all those items under there. And the last thing is if you've got a beverage dispenser, like we talked about uh, a few minutes ago, checking to see if it's dirty in those ice machines, those water vending machines. And then if it is, how often are we cleaning those and how are we making sure that they're being cleaned properly? And you can see those, that's kind of kind of gross on that one right there. All right, moving on to the medication room. There's certain things you want to look at in your medication room, you know, especially if you're making observations during when medication is being passed. Are they washing their hands properly? Are we pulling one med at a time? And are we washing our hands in between patients? Um, we want to look for expired medications. That's just something, you know, we want to make sure that uh, we're looking at if we have access to that. Um, when it comes to our point of care testing, we want to make sure our glucometers are logged properly, that our refrigerator logs are being done to make sure temperature is being kept, um, and that those items are being cleaned properly. And then also that staff can verbalize any process that may go on in that med room. Uh, you know, some other things that we do see in med rooms are med prep spaces, uh, that if there's a sink in there, uh, that there's a plenty enough separation for where you prepare meds to where that sink is, or you have a splash guard. Um, but all those items you want to be looking at when you go in that med room, you know, a lot of times um, housekeeping staff is not allowed into the medication room, so no one is cleaning those areas. 
uh, make sure you you look to see if that's a problem. Then you can uh, let your nurses know when the housekeepers come around to open those doors, to observe them, to make sure that those areas that aren't usually clean are clean. So you can see, you know, one of the items that we always see is pill cutters. Um, that are used for multiple patients aren't cleaned properly. So you see residue in that pill cutter. Uh, that may be a safety issue. We see refrigerator temperature logs or glucometer cleaning law or excuse me, glucometer logs uh, not completed properly. Um, we see sinks that are used for hand hygiene that are just completely filthy uh, that look like they've been used for other items. And then also um, being that we are given different medications or injections, we see that the sharps containers uh, fill up fairly quickly and those need to be emptied on a regular basis. Usually when they're three quarters full, uh, they need to be emptied, removed and replaced. Um, when we're talking about clean storage, so we've got clean storage rooms that could be where your supplies are, where your linens are stored, uh, where your clean equipment is stored. So you want to make sure, you know, you're looking to make sure no, suppl no supplies are stored on the floor. You can't properly clean a room if the floor is blocked. Um, you know, no items or no one-time use items are opened and being reused, uh, no expired supplies, uh, you know, shelving and drawers and cabinets are clean. One of the biggest things we notice is solid liners on the bottom shelf. It's been something that regulators have been looking for and have looked for for a while. Uh, reason being is if you mop underneath your shelves and water splashes up on your supplies, it then contaminates them. So those solid, those solid liners are important. Uh, and then you just want to make sure the area is clean. Um, with your linen that is covered and that it is was defined as a true clean storage room and it's being used for that purpose. So you'll see on our pictures, a lot of times what we see is our clean storage room. So we don't have liners on the bottom of those shelves and we've got supplies stored all over the floor. On the second picture, you see that they do have a process to bag and tag items, but the consistency is missing. So if your process is to bag those items and to tag those items, then you need to do that for every item that's in that room. If it is not done properly, the surveyor is gonna assume that it has not been cleaned. Uh, so as you see that wheelchair, they haven't bagged that or they haven't tagged that. So it's assumed that that is not clean like the rest of the equipment in that room. Um, again, items stored on the floor, you can't properly clean. And then you see here, we've got a uh, a linen cart that yeah, it's kind of covering the linen, but linen's kind of peeking out. And then we also have uh, some other items like pillows stored on top of that when they need to be covered as well if they are in a room that has other items in there. Um, I get a question all the time about linen rooms. Uh, it is okay to keep linen uncovered if, if it is in its own closet. Um, if it is a, in a closet uh, by itself and it's it, it's just being used to store linen, it's okay to store it in that closed area uncovered. If your linen is going to be in an area where it has other things in there like clean supplies, uh, any other patient care items, um, you need to make sure that that linen is covered or if it's out anywhere in your facility, it needs to be covered the entire time. Uh, all right, biohazard storage room. So biohazard management, we're looking to make sure that biohazardous waste is stored in the proper containers. You don't want to transport trash and biohazard and linen all in the same thing. You want to make sure they're separated. Uh, you want to make sure that those things are tied for transport, not just left open. Um, and you want to make sure if you get to see somebody bringing that biohazard in there, that they have the right process, they're gloving, they're making sure they dispose of that and they wash their hands. So it's a whole process with that. And the most time what we see in a biohazard storage room is just some, some practices that, uh, that aren't aligning with what the facility wants to do. So here you see a biohazard bin underneath the eye washing sink. Those two things just don't go together. So you want to make sure that biohazard is stored in an area where it needs to be or out of the way of your eye wash station or anything that you would uh, need to proper function. Uh, we see stickers either on doors for biohazard, on cans for biohazard, or on items that are torn and peeling. Uh, if that's the case, you need to make sure you go ahead and replace those stickers, uh, preferably with something that can be clean. Um, if you can see in that picture, it says, do not store anything on the floor. And as you can see, there are things that are stored on the floor. You know, if we are going to put signage up in the facility, we want to make sure that our staff understands that and respects that because that's just something very easy to walk in and see uh, that would be uh, out, of non, or out of compliance. And then on the right side, you see uh, no shelf liner on the bottom of that. So as we're cleaning uh, different, you know, different chemicals that we're mopping with can splash up on that. 
uh, but we want to make sure that um, we have our solid liners on our shelves throughout the facility. All right, talking about some special areas, some of you may be facing construction, but we talked about in the last time, you've got to have a process, uh, the ICRA that we spoke about, to do an infection control risk assessment for your construction rounds. There are different types of construction, there are different risk levels, and that has a whole laundry list of items that you need to make sure you're being done. Um, one of the best things that you can do in your environment around is if you have construction is just throw a little extra sheet in there. Um, throw something to where you're looking at those items that were on your ICRA that it said we needed to make sure are being done uh, that are being done. So um, just today I was at a facility. We made sure that it was sealed properly. We made sure that it had its HIPAA filters. We made sure that they had a single point of entrance. They weren't tracking through the facility um, and that everything was contained within that one space. They had sticky pads on the floor. So everything that was lined out in that ICRA, we went, did around and make sure that it was being taken care of. If it's not, we can then talk to the contractor, whoever's managing that project to take care of those. Um, so again, you wanna add these to your rounds if you've got construction going on. Um, and if you, uh, if you identify non-compliance, you probably wanna look at that a little bit closer or more frequently. Um, okay, just general areas throughout your facility, uh, and I know every facility is different, but when it comes to the hand washing sink and dispensers, you want to make sure that your supply is there, um, that it's the area is clean, trash receptacle is there, you've got paper towels if it's uh, soap and water, and you've got actual supply if it's alcohol hand gel. Um, you want to make sure that's done. With these, you can observe your anti-hygiene, uh, you know, the practice in your facility, and we're going to get to that here in a few. Uh, but you want to make sure that the resources are available for your, pa uh, your patients and for your staff. And then PPE equipment, especially with COVID-19, it's been extremely important to make sure that all of these items are present, that your staff knows where they are and what to use uh, whenever they have different things that come into the facility. So like we talked about in our, uh, in our last webinar about the policies, all those precautions need to be lined out as to what they need to wear for those different situations. Um, so like we talked about hand hygiene, you know, you want to know your guidelines, you want to make sure those things are there and it is a requirement from CMS and Joint Commission to make sure. Um, you know, with your hand hygiene, uh, those secret shopper observations, those can be done just to make sure that the supplies are there. Um, and also, you know, whenever we talk about that, uh, which we'll get into here in a few minutes, we want to make sure that we don't document that 100% of the time we're washing our hands. We want to get an accurate picture. And I'm going to go more into that uh, whenever we get to that section. All right, more throughout the facility. Um, we're looking at refrigerators. So there's a couple different types of refrigerators. You've got uh, patient specific refrigerators, which have to be uh, temperature monitored and have to be logged on to make sure that they're keeping their temperatures. Um, you got uh, staff refrigerators, which those do not need to be temperature monitored. Uh, all you have to do for those staff uh, refrigerators need to make sure that items are labeled and dated or that they are cleaned or defrosted properly to make sure that we're not just piling up things and we've got a bunch of nasty things in that refrigerator. And then you've also got medication refrigerators. So medication refrigerators have to be uh, organized and they have to make sure that your temperature is there. So those have to have logs as well. Um, so what you want to go around is make sure that those items are being done. You want to make sure that there's no expired items. You want to make sure that those temperatures are being documented properly. And you want to make sure that their, your temperature ranges for food versus medications or what is recommended by Joint Commission uh, or by your state agencies, Office of Public Health. Another thing we look at is sharps containers. If they're two thirds full or if they're easily accessible, uh, you wanna make sure that if you notice any of those things with your sharp containers that we're not putting anybody at risk for a needle stick, that we're emptying those items uh, whenever they are three quarters full and then that housekeeping or whoever may get those maintenance or nursing is taking those, sealing them properly and then go and put them where they need to go. So that concludes what we're talking about on environmental rounds. There's so many items in your facility, specialty areas as well. So like surgery, uh, sterile processing, um, different things like that, that in the advance, we're gonna talk more about what you wanna look for in your environmental rounds in there. But this is just getting you an idea of what basic things, uh, if you don't have them in your observations that you can add. So. Moving on, next thing we're going to talk about is observation and abstraction. So 
We talk about observing staff compliance with different things. We're talking about hand hygiene. We're talking about mass compliance and we're pulling data. We're abstracting data uh, like the infections you have throughout your facility, like your hospital acquired infection rates, your community acquired infection rates, all those data points. How do we get those? Where do we get those from? We're going to talk about that in this section. So the first thing you want to talk, we're talking about, we mentioned it a little bit earlier, is hand hygiene mask observations. This is an absolute uh, what your surveyors want to look at, and it's something that you want to pay very close attention to in your facility. Um, I'll start with hand hygiene. You want to have an accurate picture. So surveyors expect to have a realistic picture, and they absolutely know that if you've got 100% across the board, um, they know that's not accurate data. Um, a lot of the times what we've seen in our practice is that we give the responsibility to the department managers. Um, and to be completely honest, the department manager does not want to be out of compliance. They don't want their staff to be out of compliance. So what we recommend is to do it across departments, which we'll talk about here next, secret shoppers. Um, all your regulatory body, bodies are going to want to hear that, that those two words, secret shoppers. Um, what it does it, is it allows you to have somebody else looking from a third party perspective at what's going on. All you have to do is make sure that you train them. They understand when to look for it, what to look for, and then how to track those. Um, but an accurate picture, uh, what we recommend on your secret shoppers is make sure that they're across departments, you know, take radiology and allow them to monitor respiratory or take respiratory, and allow them to observe nursing. Um, you want to get a clear picture to know uh, if you've got some issues uh, with a certain department, a certain unit, a certain type of staff member. Um, and a lot of the times we can identify that easily by just getting an honest picture of that. And then last question we get is how many? So if you're doing hand hygiene observations, how many are you getting? Well, if you're just starting out, what we, what we can do if you don't have any observations is you can say, I'm going to take a couple months to get a baseline to understand what my baseline is. That can be as little as 10 observations. Uh, the number of observations can be up to 100, which we know facilities that do over 100 a month. We know facilities that do 50, 30, 10, uh, maybe five, because uh, that's all they have time to do. But it's not necessarily the number of observations that you want that's as important as the identifying if there is a true issue. Um, you know, if we've got a hand hygiene problem in surgery, that's a big issue. That's an easy place for surgical site infections to spread. If we've got a hand hygiene problem on our, on our med surge floors or in our ICU, we've got a lot of MRSA C. diff going around. You can see how that would have an impact. So you want to make sure you get an accurate picture and you do your education to look at that. Uh, in terms of mask observations, it's the same things that we talk about here. Uh, you want to get an accurate picture. I mean, you know, uh, although masking is going down, I mean, COVID is ramping back up and we're seeing it spread through our facility fairly quickly. Why you ask? A lot of it has to do with all the precautions that we put into place are not being followed anymore. And masking is one of those. Um, so if, uh, if you are still requiring masking, I would monitor that, track that. If your hospital is not, um, I would make sure there's a system to where you can risk out if you do have a higher incidence of an infection that spread via respiratory, how you wanna roll that back in and how you're gonna track compliance with that. Um, so, uh, what we say, easy to do, easy to train, easy to abstract. Make what your form is very easy to follow and very easy for you to take that data and put it into something. So um, some of the tools we use, you can see this is the form. The form asks for specific things. It asks for the uh, location, the task, what position, uh, was it done? If it was not done, was there a missed opportunity and was education provided? That translates directly to the spreadsheet that we keep. Um, which asks those same questions. So if we have those, if we have those secret shoppers that go around, all we have to do is take the data that they collected, put it into our spreadsheet, and then going back to our last page, pull up a chart that can give us a picture to track and trend uh, where we are throughout the year. So um, hand hygiene mask observation, that's going to be something that is huge. And most of the time your surveyor will ask you uh, what your compliance rate is currently. Uh, so be prepared to answer that question. The next thing, line listing infections. So on a day-to-day -day basis, you're going around and you're checking in with the different patients that you have. And some of those patients are going to have infections. So you wanna make sure that on a month-to-month -month basis that you are tracking what infections are coming through your facility. So CMS says it like this, 
Line listing infections allows you to see what infections are prevalent in your facilities. It allows you to better educate your staff and care for those with specific conditions. Um, it gives you a it gives you a picture. It gives you a picture of what's going on, and it allows you to trend. So if you've got trending infections, well, that helps you identify as month over month. Are you having an outbreak? Or are you just having a higher incidence of something? Um, so for example, if you've got a month where you've got um, maybe, I don't know, uh, one upper respiratory infection, and you've got another month where you've got 30 of them. Um, that's something that you want to, you want to figure out if that was something that was spread in the facility to start your investigation, or if it was just something that was a high prevalence of, and you need to take further action to protect your patients and your staff. Um, so trending allows you to do that. And you can see, uh, from month to month, you can see the changes on that chart we have to the left. Also, it is a great resource for survey. It is an easy picture for them. Remember, ease, ease of review is what we're aiming for with our survey. Uh, it's an easy picture for them to see what's going on in your facility. Uh, if you've had any spikes, and most of the time, if they notice anything, they'll ask you about, well, hey, I saw you had a spike here. What was going on that month? That allows you to talk about what you've been doing to correct those or that you're paying attention to those in the facility rather than just not knowing uh, what infections are coming through. Now, a lot of this is going to, uh, when we talk about antibiotic stewardship further down the line in our uh, later webinars, this is also going to translate here. As we're reviewing infections and as we're tracking those, um, we're going to be looking at those to see if those are hospital acquired or community acquired, and then we'll get into uh, the details on that in a further webinar. Okay, so in your line listing, uh, one of the things CMS requires is looking at those multi-drug resistant organisms. So we wanna make sure that MDROs are on your line listing of infections, making sure that we're paying attention to those. Uh, we've already recommended to have a policy on that knowing which ones that we may face, but you also wanna track how many of those are coming through your facility on your line list. Okay, now reportable infections. This comes along the same line as as we're looking there are specific things per CMS, you need to be able to provide an updated list of diseases to report to your local and state entities, as well as Joint Commission. They want you to trend infections over a month to month basis. Um, the state Office of Public Health has a list of infections that have a timeline for when you need to report those. Uh, with COVID-19, many of you are familiar on how to report those different to those different agencies. But outside of COVID, there are other items that we look at, Hep C, uh, new cases of, uh, you know, an STI, any of those items on our reportable list, it tells us when we need to report those. Uh, and on a month-to-month -month basis, it is our responsibility to report those. Now, you can do it uh, whatever way that you would like. We always recommend you have a copy of your state reportable disease uh, list attached to your policy, and you either set up digital reporting, which would be through IDRIS in the state of Louisiana, uh, or you develop a relationship with your Office of Public Health to where you can report those directly uh, to your local Office of Public Health. Um, always having a friend in the, the Office of Public Health is great. They're, they've always been a great resource and they can kind of give you guidance as to where to look if you've got a specific question. Um, so that's, that's our recommendation there. Uh, employee health. So when we talk about employee health, again, this is something on a month to month basis that we are doing, but this is a year long deal. And a lot of the times as infection preventionists, this gets kind of tossed on our plate if we don't have personnel uh, or we take on the responsibility to keep track of this. So again, you see it is required, uh, but your employee health duties on a month to month basis uh, are to make sure that uh, TB tests are performed on hire and annually uh, for all of your staff and that you've got documentation of that. Um, whether you keep that documentation in a spreadsheet or in files, no matter what it is, is as long as you have that year to year, uh, that's one piece. You want to make sure that you've got hepatitis B proof of vaccination or declination in that documentation as well. Um, COVID-19 vaccination or exemption is another one that we've been. I know a lot of HR departments have been focused on that, but some employee health departments are. So you want to make sure that as employee health representative, that if you've got new hires, you're collecting that paperwork or you're administering that vaccine if they have not had the opportunity to get it. Um, and so they would have that. And then the last thing is influenza vaccination or denial. This is something that, um, you know, as a as an employee health representative, you're going to need to keep track of your compliance rate throughout your facility. Now, a lot of folks ask, do we have to keep the compliance rate of our patients? Um, if, if that's something that you feel needs to be improved upon, yes, traditionally we do not. We just keep the compliance rate 
of our staff and of our facility. Uh, and we use that to give, uh, you know, to give our rate, to track our rate throughout the year. Now, uh, as we talked about with flu, it's been not, uh, you know, the flu percentages for vaccination have not been good over the past year for the past flu season. Um, but you need to make sure when you talk about that with a surveyor, you talk about the improvements that you're looking to make and the, uh, the initiatives that you're going to take to get those better. Um, so in your employee health role month to month, you want to be able to give those items, those TB tests, you want to be able to document those or collect that documentation and have those records uh, ready for if um, your surveyor is asking for evidence of those. Employee health paperwork, like I said, make it easy and make it on the front end. So with the new hire packet, make sure that you've got all the required forms that they need to fill out to streamline the process. You know, make sure you recover rec or cover all the requirements of your facility and include areas for evidence to attempt. So if you attempted uh, to give that, you want to make sure you have evidence of that. Or if you attempted to offer this, you want to make sure you've got evidence um, just to make sure you're covered on your paperwork side. Knock it out. You know, many of the items that we talk about, like flu vaccines, uh, your annual TB questionnaires, uh, your hepatitis B, if you don't have those, uh, a lot of times we recommend our, our clients or our, our facilities to do it all at once. If you've got a skills fair where you're focusing on competencies and those different things, uh, take care of it all there. Have a line. Give your flu vaccines as they're going through that mandatory education. That way you can get a bulk of it knocked out and then you can go, uh, like our last uh, point says, go to them. If you've got items that you're waiting on them to come to your office, a lot of times that's not very successful. Make sure that if you're not getting compliance, you're going to them, offering to take care of it for them. That way you can keep your compliance where it needs to be. Uh, if all else fails, make sure you do contact their department manager with the list and let them, uh, you know, get, uh, get that employee to come and uh, either get those tests, fill that paperwork out, or do what you got to do. But try to make it as streamlined as possible and to make your life a lot easier. You know, a lot of facilities that we work with, they have one spreadsheet that keeps track of everything. It's an easy way for them to go and look, pick out the month, figure out who needs to fill out what. Um, so that's that's absolutely something that you're going to need to be paying attention to. Okay, tying it all together. So we talked about a whole bunch of different data pieces, but what we have found the most success with is having one report um, that you can present in quality. You can present to the administration. You can present to the departments or department leaders or even to staff in general that ties everything that you're doing from a data collection, environmental rounds, uh, perspective and it ties it all into one report. Um, it's just an easy way to give a picture of what's going on to your facility. So as you can see, I see information, it's all in one place from your employee health uh, to your hand hygiene, you've got exposures in there, you've got hospital acquired, community acquired, you've got the rounds that you performed and you also got footnotes on reportable diseases and a little brief description of what went on in the month. This has been one of the easiest ways uh, that we've been able to keep track of everything and actually communicate what's going on in the facility to administration, to med exec. They can take a look at this and see outliers. And from those outliers, we can talk about what we've been doing to correct those items. Um, if you've got specific initiatives like goals that you want to track, you can put those into these spreadsheets. That way you can track and trend that over the monthly basis to see if you're getting better or if you need to adjust what you're doing. Um, so one session, make it count. You know, whenever we're talking about Joint Commission survey, uh, when they talk to the preventionists, it, on average, it is a shared session with quality. So you got about 30 minutes to an hour to talk about your entire program, what you've been doing, and to review your data. Having your data all in one place on one report uh, has been the easiest way for us to communicate the good work we've done in the facility and then for them to ask questions based off of that and good evidence that we're tracking and trending what we need to be tracking and trending. Okay, so all those things being said, we're tracking all that. We have our report. This is a great time to talk about IC committee meetings. Um, there's a bunch of different ways to do this, but you want to make sure that you have the following things identified for your IC committee meetings that you're doing monthly, or if you're doing those quarterly, um, that's, that's okay. It's a facility decision. Or if you're doing those as committee of a whole, or you're doing your section of infection control in an entire quality meeting, whatever your structure is, you want to make sure you have these. So you want to identify your members, make sure you include all the members and identify them through policy and through your meeting minutes. So 
Great people to include, CEO, CNO, medical director, lab director, pharmacist, all your department heads. Those are great people to have on your IC committee meeting. Uh, our committee, your IC committee, that would bring up good points or would look at things from a different perspective. Um, you want to evidence what you discussed. So you want to have minutes as to what you discussed and show for a survey that you've actively met or even for state or joint commission or any accrediting body that you've met, you've discussed those things and you had multidisciplinary buy-in on items that you're working on correcting. And then you want to ensure certain elements. So discussion about the entire program is great, but you want to make sure that in your meeting minutes, you have certain things lined out. I would right now, I would absolutely recommend a section for COVID-19. You talk about what's going on in the facility and how that looks. Uh, antibiotic stewardship, although it is a medication management thing, it is a great thing to have in your infection control committee meeting minutes, talking about what you're doing there with any changes in that. And the last thing, construction projects. Have a section about construction projects and what you're seeing from an infection control perspective. If any of those things are going on, I would make sure you have those in your minutes. Okay, so we're going to wrap it up with what I would feel like is the most important piece of this webinar, and it's talking about corrective action, how we evidence the great work that we're doing in our facility. And the biggest thing of this is facilities every day that we visit or that we talk to or that we work through survey, they don't give themselves credit for what they're doing. We are tracking and trending and doing observations, but when we find things that are out of compliance, we have no formal way of showing folks that come in our facility or even showing our staff that, hey, we found this, we have a plan to fix it, we're taking action, we're following up, and then if that's worked, we're putting it into place. So make sure you're giving yourself credit and a corrective action process is one of those ways to do that. Um, it's a great survey discussion tool. So if you've got items that, um, that you fixed in your facility, whether it be you had low hand hygiene rates, whether you had uh, a messy construction crew, whether you've had a disinfection process uh, for scopes that wasn't going properly or that cleaning wipes weren't being used. Make sure you have that corrective action documented, what you did, how you fixed that. That way you can talk about your success with surveyors. Because one of the questions they're going to ask you, what are you proud about in your program? And you need some ammunition right there to where you can talk about the different things that you've done uh, and show them the hard work that you've been doing, you and your team have been doing in the facility. And then also multi-purpose this information, use it for a quality project. You know, we don't expect, um, we've, we've taken photo reports in facilities that have been over 200 pictures. We don't expect all that to be fixed within a month. But what we can do is we can take priorities. We can take the top three that have the biggest impact on safety or patient care or infection being spread through the facility. And we can focus on those and work on those specifically as a project, uh, which is in turn part of our quality, uh, you know, part of what quality's mission is. So uh, one of the easiest tools that we've used is called a PDCA. It stands for plan, do, check, and act. Um, and this is just a step-by-step -step process that helps us identify or evidence what we've been doing since we found something and how we're progressing. So for example, I'll put one up here. I put linen not being stored properly. So apparently in this facility, the linen was not covered or it was not stored properly per the procedure. Uh, and it was at risk to get, get contaminated. So our plan, this is what we're going to do to fix the problem in the facility. So you can see, collaborate with housekeeping to identify why the linen's being stored in the certain places, meet with nursing leadership to create a plan, educate staff, perform surveillance to make sure that's being done properly. So that's our plan. So we work with our teams or, or whoever it may be to develop a plan on how to correct this. The next thing, that's where we go do stuff. That's where we go take action on fixing this problem. So as you see, we met with nursing leadership to create a plan to educate staff on proper linen storage. We did the education and the surveillance was performed to identify where the linen was being stored and if it was being stored properly. So now that's our action items that we took, that we did. Those are the things that we can tell surveyors, you know, this is what our plan was. This is what we actually did. Those can be much more detailed if you have more information or they can be kept general so that you can speak to your process. Uh, the next is check. This is when you want to go back, maybe that next month, maybe two months down the road. Uh, or maybe you want to go back that next week to check and say, okay, I found the problem. We did something about it now. Let me check back on that to see if it's been corrected. That's where in the check you can see, you see here, although the amount of linen in the patient's effects closet has been reduced, there's still some being stored. So it is getting better. Maybe that means we need to do further education. Maybe that means we need to uh, 
uh, you know, since we're seeing improvement, we need to continue educating, but whatever our plan was and we did, it is starting to work. And the act is how we move forward. So, um, you know, the act here was that we met with housekeeping director to see why I was being stored in those places. Again, just to understand the process to make sure that they were understood. Um, that is an easy process that you can do for any of the items that you find deficiency with in your facility. And it gives you evidence uh, to say, you know, Mr. Surveyor, Mr. State, Mr. Accrediting Body, uh, this is what I'm proud of. I'm proud that we found these items and we corrected those. And now we're keeping our patients and our staff safer. Um, so that corrective action piece is huge. And at the end of the day, you have to give yourself credit for your hard work. You do so much during the day. You're required to do so much, so much tracking. Uh, you get so many questions through the day. You definitely need to give yourself credit whenever the time comes to talk about your program. You want to have your evidence to say, yes, we are doing a good job. So um, that concludes our webinar. Just some general reminders. Uh, our webinar dates, you can see we've got some coming up. We've got another rural health clinic uh, basic coming up, and then we're going to get into our advanced webinars. So we're going to be talking about more things that are a little bit more technical or items that we want to make sure that we are doing uh, the proper examination to make sure that they're in compliance. So make sure that you register for those. Um, we've had great attendance and we appreciate everybody being on. Um, also the assessment application, make sure that you go fill out that application. Danae, I think if I'm correct, we've got, uh, we've got two hospital spots still open and we've got 17 RHC uh, spots open. Is that correct? So we have one hospital spot left. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. So yeah, if you are a hospital on this webinar, if you haven't signed up, definitely go sign up. What that'll get you is that'll get you access to an on-site assessment of your program, as well as, uh, which I'm so excited about, uh, the LRHA uh, made it a point to be able to deliver PPE supplies. So that is, that's something you definitely don't want to miss out on. Uh, I will also mention this for the rural health clinics. Um, if you are a provider, if, if you're a hospital and you've got provider-based clinics, it's okay for those clinics to sign up as well to have a walkthrough. Um, they, if they, you feel like they can benefit from that and that would add some consistency in, your, in your, uh, your program, then definitely go ahead and let them sign up as well. And then, Danae, how many did we have for the RHC? I think we had um, 30 total, and I think we have 14 signed up currently. Gotcha, gotcha. So there are definitely still some spots available uh, to, to be a part of the program, and we'll be rolling that out towards the end of the year. But with that, I want to thank everybody again. Uh, thank you, Danae. Thank you, LRHA. Um, we've enjoyed doing these, just really uh, trying, to, trying to get as much out in the hour that we have. But um, again, if you've got any questions, please reach out to us, and we're more than willing to help. All right, I'm just gonna give everybody a second. If you do have any questions that you wanna pop into the chat, um, I'm just gonna give just a few seconds to allow that. I'm also gonna go ahead and launch a quick closing poll. We just do a little pulse check to make sure um, that you guys got something valuable out of the session today. So if you would take that quick poll um, for me and then um, if you have any questions, you can pop them in the chat and we'll address those. Um, thank you, Taylor, and thanks everyone for joining us. Um, I will also put um, in the chat our uh, post session full survey. Um, it's very brief, it's just a couple of questions um, and that's what we use for our evaluation. So please do take that. That will also go out via email. The recording of the webinar will be available on our website early next week. Um, and then you can find all the past webinar recordings there. You can find the links to register for the future ones. Uh, as Taylor mentioned, if you're not already registered for the, there's two advanced hospital webinars coming up, part one on August 16th and part two is gonna be on September 15th. So make sure that you go to our website and register for those. Um, and as Taylor said, we do have one more hospital spot and several um, clinic spots. So if you have any offsite RHCs, go ahead and encourage them or you can apply for them um, to get that on-site training and assessment. I'm putting our website here in the chat again for you. Um, if you have uh, any questions, please feel free to reach out to us at LRHA. Um, we're always happy to help you guys. I'm gonna put my direct email here in the chat for you so you can reach out to me. And I'm gonna 
see, I don't think we had any questions. So we will wrap up for today. Thanks everyone for joining us and have a great day.